you got your victory dance. Well, I got it right here. Yeah. You're high five and walking out to the jet and stuff like that. You're most likely going to die on that mission. Hey GQ, it's Wiz. Welcome back to part two of the breakdown where we're going to be watching some more awesome fighter pilot clips. First up, Independence Day. It will be the first wave in our counterattack. Our target is to the north, centered above what remains of downtown Los Angeles. Got to stop right here. Love Independence Day because now the Marine Corps gets a little love here. We've now Marine Corps aviators are in fact naval aviators and even Coast Guard. So Navy, Marine, and Coast Guard aviators, we all wear the, uh, the same uh, wings of gold uh, as a naval aviator. So who's given the brief right now? It's, it's a little awkward to, usually if the person leading the flight, the flight lead will give the brief. Uh, at this point, it looks like some high ranking general or something like that is given the brief. So up until the flight lead steps up there, you might have an intelligence person come up and give their part of the brief. The weather person absolutely has to come up and give a brief. Maybe the, the general or the admiral steps up to, to give a little Newt Rockney speech, but the flight lead, whoever's leading this thing airborne, that's the person that's gonna lead the brief ultimately. Bring it on, bring that bad boy on, Cap. You lose? Yes, sir. You got your victory dance. Well, I got it right here. Yeah. So how we're feeling at this moment walking out to the aircraft depends on the type of mission we're going to be flying. And no matter what, whether it was wartime or a peace mission, when you're walking up onto the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, everything changes. You put your game face on. One of the most dangerous places on the face of the earth to walk or to work is the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. You got propellers spinning, you got jet blast, you got people getting blown overboard, you get people walking in the propellers accidentally. So walking around on the flight line, you want to get in your jet as quick as possible. But walking out to the aircraft, especially if it is a combat mission, you kind of got your game face on. We're taught to compartmentalize, meaning I'm not wondering, you know, if I paid the mortgage, is the grass too long or anything like that. You have to put all those things aside to focus on the mission. At the end of the day, we are all about the mission and we are focused. If you're high five and walking out to the jet and stuff like that, you're most likely going to die on that mission. Hey, hey, don't get pre patrol on me, soldier. We don't light up to the fat lady things. When I heard that line, I could hear every Marine across the world, literally, their head explode. He called him soldier. Don't ever call a United States Marine a soldier. A soldier is in the United States Army. A Marine is in the United States Marines. <laughs> It's a huge misperception about fighter pilots, uh, especially in these movies. Captain Jimmy, whatever it says, Wild, Raven. A lot of people think that that's your jet. That's not your jet. So in a typical fighter squadron, we might have anywhere from 12 to 15 jets. The first two jets in the squadron, they have the name of the a commander of the air group, and then the commanding officer's jet, and then the executive officer, and then it kind of goes down the picking order till we're running out of pilots or running out of jets. So a common misconception about fighter aircraft is that that's your airplane. So the pre-flight preparation that you're seeing in Independence Day is pretty realistic. Walking up to the aircraft, you'll be greeted by who is called the plane captain. In the Air Force, it's, it's called the crew chief. They are assigned an airplane and they know the hydraulics, the fuel, they give it the tender love and care that we just can as aviators. So you salute the plane captain, give them a firm handshake and they're gonna give you a brief about the status of the aircraft. Any, what we call gripes. Hey sir, the last time this jet flew, the, the radar had a couple issues or they were some hydraulic problems. So they'll give you a quick brief and then you walk around the aircraft and do a pre-flight because it's an extra set of eyes. It's what we call mutual support. We take care of each other. Our boys, where are they? ETA to target, four minutes. So that looks like the Battle of Britain <laughs> on whatever that was supposed to be some sort of radar screen, just a, a horde of the good guys going after a, a bad guy. We wouldn't have that many aircraft necessarily going that close, but I don't remember reading a book about huge ginormous enemy spaceship and the requirements for the aircraft. But today, 
we have what we call the F-35, the Joint Strike Fighter. It can fly completely autonomously. An F-35 most likely is going into enemy combat by itself because it doesn't need anybody else. It has that much situational awareness. So the days of, you know, kind of this Battle of Britain, hey, launch everybody type of thing are kind of going away in, a, in essence. Why we on this particular mission, we'll never know. But I do know here today that the Black Knights will emerge victorious. So the, the relationship with your squadron mates is absolutely uh, critical to mission success. So in a fighter squadron, you had to have absolute trust, faith, and confidence uh, in, your, in your fellow wingmen. And if you didn't, the unit broke down. It's a family. You know, there's give and take and arguments and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if there's any problems, we circle the wagon and protect each other. We can make fun of each other, but if anybody outside of our squadron did, uh, now you got an ass kicking coming. The willingness to literally lay your life down, to potentially lose your life, to take care of a squadron mate, really makes it uh, an organization I've never seen again in my life. I left being a fighter pilot to go to Wall Street, and I can't even tell you what a letdown it was. I mean, on Wall Street, it, the guys will push their own mother in front of a train to make a buck. In the military, just not, it, it, it is a complete culture disconnect. They were family members and, and are to this day. Next up, Iron Eagle. This has got to be the worst series of fighter pilot movies God ever created. And it couldn't happen to a better service, the United States Air Force. It's just, you couldn't, it couldn't be any worse. <laughs> I mean, so the Navy Marine Corps team got Top Gun and my Air Force buddies got Iron Eagle. Clear for takeoff, runway 30, over. Heard him. Think you can get us over to runway 30? Yeah. If you come up here and show me where the throttle is. To begin with, so we got a teenage kid flying an F-16. So it, it, here's what's funny about all this stuff. So the Air Force is pretty anal about a lot of stuff, especially security. Not that the Marine Corps and Navy are, are lax about this, but we have bigger things to do, like fly jets off of a boat or storm beaches. So the, the security on an Air Force base is epic. So the fact that this kid, like, God is even sitting here right now is physically impossible. I, I can't even, it gives me agita watching this. <laughs> but apparently this, this kid's dad was, is an Air Force fighter pilot or got shot down and uh, you know, he, he's got to rescue him. If the Air Force is resorting to teenage kids to rescue their downed pilots, we're in a load of trouble, man. <laughs> Tyler, this is Falcon 6, ready for takeoff. Take so the oxygen mask uh, contains your microphone to talk and obviously oxygen. I hated the thing. A, a minimum you have to wear during takeoff uh, and landing. What happens if they're flying along at 400 miles an hour and something bad happens and they have to eject? There's no wind. And all of a sudden, instantaneously, you're in 400 mile an hour wind. That mask is going to rip off probably take the helmet off and might take your head off with it too. Up at higher altitude, you definitely have to have your mask on because even though the cockpit of a fighter jet is pressurized, guess what? You got a little pinhole leak in the canopy and the pressurization leaks, you could end up dead. Where you wanna go? You're driving. Let's see what you got. You sure you're up to it? You don't want those hot dogs, are you? Oh man. Here we go with the with the music in the in the in the jet, you know, <laughs> bringing your what, what, what is that a, a Walkman? First of all, we have designated operating areas. So as soon as you get all airborne, you're supposed to go be going to a place, a restricted area, a warning area, or a military operations area. This whole hey, we just got airborne out of an Air Force base. Let's just start doing. <laughs> it's comical, but let's see what he does. Yeah. You know? Now I'm really starting not to like you. <laughs> Head over to the range. Yes. So the idea that this colonel with thousands of hours in the F-16 could be like feeling a little not up to being pulled around by a teenager is comical at this point. It is, this is just pure comedy gold. Anytime I took off in the F-18 Hornet, even if it was a ferry flight, for example, taking off out of point A just to get to point B, 
I rolled the jet inverted at some point. Just getting airborne out of Air Force Base X to go do some aerobatics, uh, it doesn't happen. I cut off that stuff! I'll screw up my rhythm. So we got a teenager in an Air Force F-16 dropping live weapons. It just doesn't get any more realistic than this. <laughs> I mean, come on. And he needs his music to be able to bomb correctly. Unless it's wired into your headset, you're not going to hear it. All we hear in the jet, it's surprisingly quiet. You don't hear the jet engine. You hear the hum. It's the hum of the electronics, too, and the, and the ECS, we call it, the Environmental Control System. There are guys nowadays that I know who, you know, they'll put their ear pods in or something like that, but not during mission critical parts. There are limited ranges in the United States where you can drop live ordnance, but it's it's very, very obviously restricted away from the, the civilian population. But you have to drop live weapons to get familiar with their use. The first time loading live weapons or you dropping live weapons in a combat situation isn't the first time you want to be doing it. You want to have done this in training a lot before before doing it live. All right, I'll turn this thing around. Let's, let's head back to base. Damn it, Chappie, I'm doing it my way. If, if the instructor pilot says, all right, this flight's done, let's go home, and the guy's like, no, screw it, I'm going to do it my way, literally when you got on the deck, it would, be, it would have been an ass kicking. This is physically impossible that it would have happened. It makes me laugh, but it's just, it's inconceivable that this would happen. Well, and it's better, too, because he turned up the volume, so he's going to get better now because his cheesy 80 music is louder. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, he just put the bombs right through the target right there and he's going to go save his dad. God bless him. I, I would have done the same thing for my dad, <laughs> but it never, ever would have happened. I love the little display in the cockpit that said target destroyed. I, I don't know how the jet figures out that you destroyed the target, but yeah, that, that doesn't happen either. So that's another unrealistic element is the fact that I could be sitting in the jet watch the bomb go right into somebody's window, blow up the entire building, and still not know until we have what we call BDA, Battle Damage Assessment. So at the end of the day, Iron Eagle uh, has got to be the most ridiculous uh, movie about fighter aviation that could have ever been created. I'm gonna stick with Top Gun, and I'm gonna stick with Maverick at the end of the day. Next up, Dunkirk. So this is a, uh, I believe it's a Spitfire. So the Battle of Dunkirk, just a strategic disaster. In the military, we have a term called successful failure. The way that the British rallied to save their troops from Dunkirk is just fantastic. And the performance out of these aviators was nothing less than stellar. 70 gallons. 68 gallons for this leader. So obviously back in the day, these guys aren't too worried about oxygen, mainly because they're not flying really high up at altitude. So they could kind of have their mask hanging down here and you can see how they hold it up to their mouth to realistically be able to talk. Now they're checking out their fuel. And as you can see, they're switching to different tanks. So, you know, they can say, hey, the right wing tank has this much or the fuselage tank has this and the left wing has that. So they're reporting in with their fuel state. And the reason you do this every once in a while, first of all, what if all of a sudden out of the blue, you developed a fuel leak and you didn't notice it and all of a sudden you flame out. So checking your fuel periodically, you know, keeps you, keeps that scan going. On that gauge, even when it gets lively, safe enough to get back. So right now they're a little tight. If you're in bad guy country, you don't want to be flying close formation as a bunch of airplanes. Because if you look at the right wing and the left wing, those wingmen right there are staring at who? They're staring at the flight lead right now. I don't want to be flying formation and what we call sucking wingtip. So these two wingmen right now are sucking wingtip. I want them spread out a little bit more and their eyes out of the cockpit looking around for enemy aircraft. It does no good to be flying this close formation right now when you could have, what, six, six eyeballs out of the sky instead of just the flight lead looking around. 42, I have you on my port. I have no eyes on 40 leader, over. Understood, part this one. Orbit for a look. 
So back in the day, you know, this early on in Dunkirk, there wasn't any aviation radar per se. The, the aircraft just didn't have any radar. The only radar was your brain housing group uh, and your eyeballs. So really having to look hard out there and, and literally a speck on the horizon could be an enemy fighter. All they had was their eyeballs. So they were a lot better at picking up visual and they had a much more disciplined, what we call scan, meaning they just didn't sit here and look around randomly. They had a pattern that they would go through and look through the sky and not randomly. So where can you look? For example, this guy on the right wing can look behind the wing, that left wing means six o'clock, right? And the left wingman can look all the way to the right and look behind that guy's six o'clock. So whenever you hear the term check six, it means look behind you. Flight discipline and lookout discipline is very, very key in situations like this. And back in the day, the best place, and even to today in air to air combat, you want to come from what's called out of the sun. Unless you're, you know, a superhuman, you can't stare into the sun. So if you come, if you decide to attack from out of the sun, you have a very big tactical advantage. I think we might actually see that. Found it, 11 o'clock. Break. The first person who sights an enemy aircraft, you call it out, bandit, and then the clock code, bandit, 11 o'clock, and you call out the position. He's on me. So above the canopy, they actually had a mirror. So he, he isn't straining to look behind him at this point. He's actually just looking up above his canopy into a mirror. And he, he can see, I believe it's a, a Messerschmitt on his six o'clock. So right now, he's in a tough spot. He's got to shoot this German down, but he doesn't want to shoot his wingman down. So there you go. Awesome. So you're looking at a gun reticle. So this is what is uh, displayed right in front of the pilot's vision. It's right in his line of sight. And in these old fighter planes, the guns out in the wings are aligned to what we call right in the middle right there. That's called a pipper. You see that little orange dot? That is right on that dude's head. However, when he's squeezing the trigger right now, guess where those bullets are going to go? Behind him. So what we have to do whenever you're trying to shoot somebody down, you have to do what we call pulling lead. So right now when he squeezes those bullets, this guy's already going to be gone from where he is right there. So he's got to aim let's say, I don't know, one or two, three airplanes in front of him to put those bullets out in front of the bad guy so he flies through them. In a modern fighter aircraft, there's not that many. I think uh, 600-ish in the F-18, which might sound like a lot, but it's literally this much. You ready? That's it. So about two to three seconds, if you kept the trigger down in the F-18, you'd be out of bullets. A lot more back in the day, they, these guys weren't carrying air-to-air -air missiles or radar, so their wings were full of a lot more ammunition. Once you're out of bullets, you're out of bullets. I mean, there's been some circumstances of you know guys running out of ammo and ramming other airplanes. And we saw just horrifically in the Pacific where the Japanese used what they called kamikaze, uh, the divine wind. They would lock these guys in a plane like this, put a bunch of gas in a plane, put a bunch of bombs on it, and have them go try and crash into an aircraft carrier or a ship. They were the first, if you want to call it, guided bombs <laughs> of the modern warfare era. So even if you're running out of ammo, you still got you at the end of the day. Right there, perfect shot. And now he puts some rounds right in front of the German aircraft and the German's gonna fly right through him. Boom. He's about to splash into the ocean. So splash one, kind of Navy fighter pilot, Navy Marine fighter pilot for, I just shot somebody down. Splash one, splash two, splash three. So great fighter discipline, great pulling lead uh, and didn't waste any bullets. Is he down? Yeah, he's down for the count. What happened? They're both staring where? At a dude flying into the water. The guy was on fire, he's going into the water. 
why are they both staring at him? And one of them just got shot by who? Another German. So very, very bad. That's the hair on the back of your neck should stand up if we're both staring at the same piece of sky uh, or water in this case, and nobody has their eyes out looking uh, for the other bad guy. So great scene, Dunkirk, great movie, and really speaks to the uh, the heroism of the uh, of the men and women in the uh, Royal Air Force. You can tell that they actually are, are using the, the Spitfire aircraft. You can tell, I think, think they even had the actors in the airplanes. Uh, so very realistic. All right. Thanks for watching part two of the breakdown. Those were some awesome clips. Had an absolute blast. Make sure you stay safe out there and fly Navy. Thank <laughs> you.